scientists have identified neurons that can help paralyzed people get back on their feet. Researchers at the Federal University of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland, studying how to restore motor functions to people with spinal cord injuries, have identified a group of nerve cells that are crucial in the process of regaining mobility by paralyzed people. Previously, the same group of researchers had shown that targeted electrical stimulation of the area that controls leg movement was able to help patients regain some of their lost motor function. In a long-term research program, Swiss scientists from the Federal University of Technology in Lausanne and the University Hospital in Lausanne, in cooperation with scientists from other institutions, are investigating how to help patients who have lost the ability to move as a result of spinal injury. The goal is to restore motor functions to paralyzed people. In a new study, researchers have shown that targeted epidural stimulation of the area that controls leg movement can help these patients get back on their feet. What's more, they identified a population of nerve cells that are crucial in this process. Description of the research results were published in two articles in the journal, Nature. A car accident or other serious injury can severe the neural connections in the spinal cord, severing the circuits that allow people to control various parts of the body. But some connections remain, stimulating them with electricity, by surgically implanting a bundle of electrodes into the lower part of the spinal cord, in conjunction with physiotherapy and rehabilitation can restore control over the body. Swiss scientists have previously shown that paralyzed people can regain the ability to move. In 2018, a team from the Federal Polytechnic University of Lausanne and the University Hospital of Lausanne showed that, in combination with training and exercise, delivering electrical impulses via an implant to the nerves of the lower spine, epidural electrical stimulation, can help people with spinal cord injury regain control of paralyzed leg muscles for years. More on this topic in the text. The implant put three paralyzed men on their feet. In a study from a year ago, a team from the University Hospital in Lausanne, thanks to electrically stimulating implants that control the movements of the trunk and legs, put people completely paralyzed from the waist down to their feet. Researchers have known for some time that electrical stimulation of the spinal cord after an injury can restore a patient's motor function, at least to some extent. However, neither doctors nor scientists are sure why or how this approach works. Therefore, a further nine people with severe or complete paralysis were included in the new phase of the study. For five months, the patients underwent spinal electrical stimulation. They also used intensive exercise and rehabilitation. All of them regained or improved their ability to walk after using the new therapy. Importantly, as in previous studies, the improvement in motor functions was maintained in patients after the end of the neurorehabilitation process and after the end of the use of electrical stimulation. This suggests that the nerve fibers used in walking have reorganized. In the course of the study, the researchers were able to visualize the activity of nerve cells in the spinal cord of these people both before and after undergoing treatment while walking. Surprisingly, after treatment, the spinal cords of these people showed less activity than before. Contrary to intuition, after starting the stimulation, the activity of nerve cells in this place decreased. To better understand the mechanism at work here, the researchers repeated the study, but this time in mice whose spinal cords had been damaged. The researchers mimicked every aspect of the mice's treatment, from trauma and electrical stimulation to training with a purpose-built robot for stability. 
They also measured the activity of genes in specific populations of nerve cells in the spinal cord during various phases of therapy. This resulted in an extremely detailed map of the types of nerve cells in the spinal cord. They then used a machine learning algorithm to search for mouse neurons that showed the greatest changes in gene activity at specific stages of rehabilitation. In other words, the program was used to determine which populations of nerve cells were most important during the recovery process. The team noted the surprising property of a specific subpopulation of neurons in the spinal cord of mice expressing the VSX2 and HOXA10 genes. Their activity after electrical stimulation increased significantly. These neurons are not essential for walking in healthy mice, but they have been found to be essential for restoring motor function after spinal cord injury. Silencing these neurons in mice impaired the recovery process via electrical stimulation of the spinal cord. While their activation, even in the absence of stimulation, improved the recovery process. By contrast, blocking the activity of these cells in healthy mice did not affect their ability to walk. As acknowledged by Gregoire Cortine, one of the team leaders from the Federal University of Technology in Lausanne. These neurons are probably not the only ones playing a role in regeneration and that other populations of neurons may also be important. After a spinal cord injury, there's a lot of chaotic activity where many neurons are trying to function, says Jocelyn Bloch, co-author of the study. Electrical rehabilitation organizes the network of cells and you actually increase the activity of a certain cell type while all other cells are not activated. These cells are important for the recovery of walking ability in mice after injury. But when we turn them off in healthy mice, it doesn't affect their ability to walk. Amen Azim a neuroscientist at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, California, conceded that the same neurons are likely to be responsible for the effect in humans. As the architecture of the spine is very similar in vertebrates, including humans and mice. According to him, a detailed understanding of the spinal cord circuits could allow neuroscientists to directly manipulate the activity of specific neurons through other treatments, such as gene therapy. Stem cell therapies that could replace key populations of neurons could also help with recovery. This study is only the first step. And many questions remain to be answered before epidural electrical stimulation becomes the primary therapy for spinal cord injury patients. It is still unclear whether this approach causes side effects or how long the improvement lasts. These findings may also lead to research for types of neurons that help recover other motor functions. How much do the clouds weigh? They are heavier than we might think. Looking at the sky and looking at the clouds, it may seem to us that they are so fluffy, soft and light. But it is not. In fact, clouds are much heavier than we think. We probably associate clouds with something light, which is sometimes used, for example, in advertisements. We can also easily fly through them by plane. However, clouds, although they appear fluffy and light, are actually much heavier than they appear. We can guess that the total cloud mass is quite significant. So why do they only fall on us in the form of rain? First of all, the water droplets in the clouds are not raindrops in terms of size and mass. They are definitely smaller than them about a million times, although even the diameter of a raindrop is about 2 millimeters. In an analogous way, we could, for example, relate the mass of the Earth to the mass of the Sun. So it's not surprising that they don't fall off so quickly. In addition, they are kept in the air by a wind much stronger than the one we deal with even on a very windy day. 
Water droplets are also held in the air by heat convection. And since the air directly below the clouds is denser than them, when the warm air rises up, it can be said that the clouds behave a bit like latte foam. However, when the droplets cool down, they begin to coalesce, forming larger droplets, the mass of which at some point becomes so large that they fall as rain. How do you even weigh clouds? First of all, we can try to determine the mass of water vapor that they are composed of. But in order to do so, we must determine how densely the water droplets are concentrated in them. An attempt to determine the mass of a typical cumulus was made by Margaret Lamon of the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. However, we must bear in mind that different types of clouds will have different weights. For example, cirrus is much lighter, because the amount of water molecules contained in it is smaller. Cumulonimbuses on the other hand, are much heavier for a similar reason. Margaret Lamone decided to use the possibilities that mathematics gives us. She started with the shadow cast by the cloud, thus estimating its height. The next step was to calculate the volume. Some simplification is used here, because of course clouds never take the shape of a perfect cube but it is quite common for their width to be approximately equal to their height. Based on previous available research results, the scientist estimated the density of water droplets at one half gram per square meter. In this way, having estimated the volume and density, she could proceed to calculate the mass. The oldest runestone in the world was found in Norway. A runestone with inscriptions from 2,000 years ago was discovered in an ancient grave near Tirafjorden in eastern Norway in autumn 2021. Archaeologists believe that this is the oldest artifact of its kind ever found, and it may shed some light on the development and use of runic writing in ancient Scandinavia. Found two years ago, a square block of brownish sandstone measuring approximately 30 by 30 centimeters is probably the oldest runestone in the world. The inscriptions carved on it look like scribbles at first glance. But they may be the earliest example of words written in Scandinavia. The so-called runestones, on which we find this type of writing, usually accompany burial sites. Especially those from the Viking era. Runic writing is the oldest writing, the oldest alphabet that was known in Scandinavia. However, the unusual discovery mentioned at the beginning was made by Norwegian archaeologists. It is estimated that the runestone they found was recorded about 2,000 years ago. If confirmed, it would mean that the previous record in this field would be beaten by several centuries. So far, it was believed that the first stones of this type began to appear in Norway and Sweden in the 300s or 400s of our era. It turns out, however, that they could have been formed much earlier than the world of science even considered it. The stone on which the runes are carved is brown sandstone. Its shape is similar to a square measuring 30 by 30 centimeters. It was found in 2021, but only recently scientists boasted of this extraordinary discovery. The archaeological work that led to its discovery was carried out in Tirafjorden, northwest of Oslo. They were related to plans to build a railway line. In this place, at the end of 2021, a tomb remembering ancient times was found carbon dating of the bones and wood found in it allows us to estimate the moment of carving the inscription on the runestone for the period from 1 to 250 AD. According to experts from the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo, the same experts also say that this type of discovery is a runologist's dream. Everyone emphasizes that this find is unique. Although its origin is still unknown, scientists managed to translate the inscription on the stone into Latin. 
The problem, however, is that the recorded inscription seems to be meaningless. Because the word obtained in this way is a dibberig. Scientists speculate that this inscription could somehow refer to the person who was buried in the discovered grave. Perhaps it is the name of the buried person.